Good afternoon, South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Bonang Mateba. This is Afternoon Express, and we're live on SABC3. It's a Monday. It's a brand new week. Thank you very much for tuning in today with some of South Africa's most iconic sportsmen right here in the loft. Now, our first guest has made history as the first person of color to play international uh, cricket for South Africa. And although he only played three test matches and three ODIs, he is a household name. Omar Henry is in the loft to tell us a little bit more about his journey and, of course, what he's up to to, you know, recently. We also have the managing director of uh, the Cricket School of Excellence to tell us about all the incredible and wonderful work they do all across the country. Also, if you want to, you know, fine-tune your cricket skills, we're giving away some incredible uh, training cricket hampers, courtesy of the uh, Cricket School of Excellence, so make sure you don't go anywhere. I'm not alone in the loft. We are live. We want to hear from you. Interact with us. We are on Twitter, on Facebook, and of course on Instagram. Hashtag Afternoon Express. Danilo is in the kitchen while I'm here trying to learn a little bit more about cricket. How are you doing? <laughs> How's it, Bonang? It's so good to have you back on the show. Everyone's missed you so incredibly much. It's nice to be live with you right here on SABC3. Welcome to Afternoon Express. And I'm so excited to be in the kitchen. Myself and Clem today are going to make something so delicious. And obviously, because it's all about cricket on the show today, there are so many puns I'm just dying to make because I heard you're making a short rib. I was really hoping for a short leg. Like the position in the cricket. But there's so many <laughs> more still to come. But what we want you guys to do at home is obviously go and find us on the social media sites. If you have any terrible, terrible, terrible cricket puns, I want you to tweet them to us right now at Afternoon Chat using that hashtag Afternoon Express. If one comes to mind during the show today, make sure you tweet us or go onto Facebook. There are two terrible puns that I made up that are on that Facebook yeah. page. You guys can vote for which one's the worst, eh? Hey? Not the best, the worst. I can't think of any. Ah. I'm stumped. Ah! <laughs> that was a really good one, actually. I like that. Pushing boundaries with this meal. All right, what are we making? We're making waffle bread. Yummy. With sweet sticky short rib Oof. stuffed in the waffle bread. Oof. And it comes with like a pack of napkins. Oh, it sounds so you're gonna decadent. Need it. You're going to. It's one of those meals you just don't worry about. Get your hands in nice and dirty. You know, it was following health week. We had to like balance. Totally, balance. yes. We learned that on last week on this show, right here on Afternoon Express. If you want to get this recipe and get making this decadent, delicious short rib uh, with our, uh, what did you call them, waffle? Waffle breads. Waffle breads. You can make them and uh, get the recipe from our website, afternoonexpress.co.za. There you can also find uh, the shopping list for this incredible uh, spread of meals we're making on the show today. So make sure you enjoy the cooking with us. Bonang is uh, standing by on the couch. Thank you so much, Delora. Sounds delicious. I can't wait to tuck in. But my first guest in 1992, he was called up to make his debut for South Africa in a Tex match uh, cricket against India in Durban. He made history that day, not only being the first person of color to play a test match for South Africa, but also being the oldest person to ever make a debut for the country at the tender age of 40. He only played three tests and three ODIs, but his positive impact on the game is still felt to this day. Joining us in the loft, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Omar Hendry. What an honor. Welcome to Afternoon Express, sir. Thank you. Now, you grew up in uh, the Cape Winelands. Which area uh, did you spend most of your childhood? Possibly the most famous of the Cape Winelands, and that is Stellenbosch. Mm. Lovely place. Um, I think that is where my sporting sort of passion and love um, was installed in me um, because of Stellenbosch University, uh, the community itself, a very sport-loving community, and you just follow. Absolutely. And do you remember the age where you, uh, you know, realized that you actually are so good at cricket that you could pursue it as a career? Um, I think I, I had to make some serious decisions because I played rugby, I played soccer, I played tennis, table tennis, uh, cricket. And eventually I had to make a choice between soccer and cricket. Rugby I wasn't built for. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I decided just to play cricket. And that's a very, you know, fascinating decision because in the apartheid years, for a person of colour, was it even realistic to think to pursue cricket or to get into cricket? Well, and during the apartheid years, I was never sort of thinking of playing even soccer uh, for the country. It was more to go overseas mm. and pursue a career um, and see how far I can push myself in that direction. So once I decided to play cricket, um, it was 
my vision was to go abroad um, and then see what happens. Yeah. And talking about overseas, I mean, you started playing competitive cricket in South Africa and then you quickly moved on over to Scotland. Yeah. My first question is why particularly Scotland and, you know, how that journey was and that experience was for you? It happened by accident because um, I left in 77 um, for three months just to have a feel and experience um, because I wasn't sure. Um, my parents weren't too keen for me to leave. So we struck a deal, three months, and see what happens, and then I've got to come back, give them some feedback, um, and see whether there's opportunities. Um, and then in 78, I went for a full season. Um, and for some reason, I, I played very well. Um, where the first three months was very iffy. Uh, I had to under get used to the weather and the conditions and the English weather wasn't very good. Um, coming from South Africa, you play with the sun on your back. So then one Sunday I got a call um, and I didn't, I couldn't understand the accent. Um, yeah. And it was a Scotsman calling me. Now he apparently comes to Manchester on a regular basis for business. And he saw my name in the paper and says, why didn't you come to Scotland? Wow. And I didn't know that they played cricket in Scotland. <laughs> so there I was and the only thing I could agree with, with him was, I'll come up for a weekend mm. to experience it and then see whether I like it and whether you like me, whatever the case is, and then we can talk after that. So after the first weekend, it rained. So I played, I think, an hour of the game and we couldn't play any further. So I went up the next weekend and the little bit that they saw, they were happy with. Um, what I saw, I, I liked where the cricket ground was. It was in an estate with two golf courses and I thought, well, I could spend my life here. Um, maybe playing some golf every now and again <laughs> and whatever. Yeah. So I just closed my eyes and said, yes, I'm coming. Fantastic. And I mean, you mentioned your parents earlier on. Was it difficult for you to convince them to say, you know, mom and dad, I want to pursue cricket as a career? You, did you have to prove yourself, obviously, a little, a little bit more? Because, I mean, in those days, I don't think parents could... Cr cricket, come on, was it even a serious thing to do? Look, the plus was I, I come from a very sporting family. Oh. Um, mother, father, um, brothers, sisters, all played sport. Um, but professionally, it was taboo. Um, yeah. You know, you had to go and study. Um, otherwise, forget it. So I was the one who went against the grain and said, look, study, not for me. I want to go and play some cricket. So it took some time. Um, and that's why I only left when I was 24, 23, 24. Wow. But, uh, you know, I have to go to, for a short commercial break, but when you come back, you mentioned your family. I mean, your son-in-law plays uh, cricket as well. So we're going to get into that and also how you made your debut, the controversy around your inclusion in the South African cricket team. There's so much to talk about. So make sure you don't go anywhere. After the break, we're making sweet and sticky slow-cooked beef short rib, and we're back on the couch with cricket legend Omar Henry. Remember, we are live, so if you have any questions or comments for Omar Henry, tweet us at Afternoon Chat using our official hashtag Afternoon Express or comment on our Facebook page. Don't move more after the break. A warm welcome back to Afternoon Express. So we're in the kitchen and that means we're about to make something so delicious. And what I'm so excited about cooking with Clem for every time I'm in this kitchen is he does not ever do ordinary. So today we're doing a sweet sticky short rib. Then we're filling that inside with a waffle bread that we're making a little bit later on on the show. So what am I making? A sweet sticky huh? short rib. Sweet <laughs> sticky short rib. He made me practice this off air so many times because I did not actually remember what it is that we we're making. Sweet sticky short rib. Inside waffle bread. But we've got to make the short ribs first because they okay. take the longest to cook. So. This actually could fall under a budget meal, believe it or not. Totally. Short if you don't want to make it budget, so if you don't want to make it budget, you want to fit into our cricket theme. I was really hoping that you'd make us a duck. 
maybe a golden duck. <laughs> Could do, it actually would work. It would be yeah, very yeah, nice, yeah. actually. So I've got the short rib, mm -hmm. and this one, um, it's a little cheaper than the normal like short rib chunks that we get. Okay. Why? Because a little bit of maintenance in there, because the bone's in there. Ah. But that's amazing, it's, it's easy, because we're going to slow cook this, and what happens is the bone kind of separates by itself already. Yummy, it's one of those ones where you cook it for long enough and it just starts to fall off the bone, keeping the meat nice and tender. Exactly, so in a Yummy. heavy base pot, I'm going to start letting those go. Um, and what we've spoken about this before, once meat hits the pan, we don't touch it, uh -uh. right? So it's in the pot, that's gonna brown up all nicely. We're gonna make sure that it gets a crust on the bottom, for, let it sit for like a minute and a half. Yes. Short rib can take that heat, don't worry yeah. about it. Nothing's gonna happen, it won't burn. Also, there's a nice bit of fat on there too, so even if you're crisping up a bit of the fat, it's delicious. All and it'll rent out slightly as well. Yeah. So let's all imagine that that's like been browned off nicely. <laughs> so we're gonna go off with some carrot. And you know what? The carrot's not going to be eaten, and I don't, I don't want people to like stop peeling carrots if it's going to be used for a flavoring age. You know what I mean? Yes. Keep the skins on there, but keep make the sure you rinse it obviously. Just throw all whatever could be left on the skins, but keep it as whole as possible. It's just for the flavor. Just for the flavor. Some celery. There we go. That nice savory flavor you get from celery. Yum. And some garlic. Just smash it up. When you say smash it up, just with what? How Let me you show you. Let me show you. So imagine this guy has not been smashed. Yeah. This is a normal garlic loaf. So it's just to bring out that natural flavor in the garlic. Knife bashes slightly oh, and I it see. flattens it. And you can immediately get that massive Ooh, whiff wow. of garlic. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> <totally> Italian. <laughs> Yummy. That's like Love your... it. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's going. Mm. Just pour some water in there. But remember, we've browned off that meat nicely. It's going. So water in. Lid on. We just try to drop, drop this and we just move it to the side. So what happens is you bring it up to a boil, pop it in the oven. Okay. Two hours, 180, that meat's going to be full of the bone tender. Oh, delicious. So it's going to be first cooked on the stove, obviously to get nice and browned, get all those flavors to come out of the meat itself, and then you pop that into the oven to finish off the rest of the process and tenderize it nicely. That's right. So like I said, the bone will kind of just slip out on its own. Okay. So separate the meat from the bone. You'll have these amazing chunks of meat. Uh -huh. Just get it in a hot pan. There's a little bit of oil in there. There's enough oil that's already on the meat. So yes, because all the fat that you've rendered out of there. So that's awesome. And that's why we love short ribs so much because it's got that natural. And you've added no seasoning into this thing at all. It's just basically been your carrots and your celery just to give it some extra bits of flavor to draw all the other natural flavors out. And now the real sticky sweet that's right. stuff. That's And there's a reason we don't add salt or pepper to that in the beginning because we're going to use quite strong flavors when it comes to our yeah. sweet sticky ribs. So okay. I've got some chili paste. You can use a sambal ulek which is just chilies in a blender. Sorry, sambal ulek. Sambal ulek. Oh, yes. I'm not, I'm not making up words. I've got that in my cupboard. It's just lying next to the rice. Sambal ulek. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. There. This is just my version of a chilli paste I'm using today. Okay. But you could use any chilli paste. Mm. This is quite Give a mini one. Sorry, it's quite no. potent, quite potent, but it's mm. good. Oh, it is delicious. It's got a sort of sweet flavor to it. Exactly. It's, it's got flavor too. along with the heat. Yeah. So sambal ulek's in there, or any chilli paste. Some sesame seeds. I just like the, the flavor of toasted sesame mm. seeds. Oh, delicious, yum. Some soy sauce. We're just gonna give that a mix. Oh wow, if, look at that if flame. We got it, no, 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 that's not a flame bay. Stop getting uh. my. No, stop it. <laughs> if you guys are wondering why he's making this kind of reaction, on Afternoon Express, we've tried so many times that Kem's coming here to show us a new trick that he's learned in the kitchen at home, and not once has it ever worked on the live television yeah, show. He's trying to make it flame bay, nothing ever Never happens. Never works. Can you pass it? <laughs> this time he's not even trying it and it does Can happen. you pass the spatula on the end for me? Oh, this spatula, just spatula. That. Cool. So we've got the soy sauce in there, our chili paste, some sesame seeds. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hit it with some sweet chili. That's yes, where our that's sweetness sweet is going to come from. That's coming through. And it'll also make it quite sticky, too. Exactly. Yum. So it's, it's reducing right now. And that's what you want. You want it to start reducing and glazing our short ribs. So give oh, it a toss. Delicious. Oh, and you yum. can see it's already beginning to reduce. Our ribs are looking sweet and sticky. All glazed, all amazing. And again, that, well, that um, whatever you use, what the soya sauce is also adding to that brownness of the meat itself, which is. And also why we don't yeah. add salt. In the beginning. Exactly, I see, Clem. There's always a method to your madness. <laughs> yeah, okay, I hope delicious. So. so that's gonna obviously sit like that. Once that's starting to reduce nicely, that creates a sticky sauce that's around it. There's nothing more to do with that except make the filling, make the thing we're gonna fill it with. Part two. Delicious! If you guys want to get this specific recipe and the shopping list, it's on our website, afternoonexpress.co.za. Make the sticky short ribs. Find the shopping list for you there too. If you guys want to make this dish with us right here on Afternoon Express. Later on, we're gonna be making that flatbread. We're calling it the waffle bread. So we're gonna make uh, you can make it in so many different ways at home. It's lots of fun to do, especially with the children. In the meantime, though, Bonang is standing by on the couch. Thank you so much, Dinner. I'm just like, do not burn the kitchen. Okay, whatever you do, be careful. But I'm still in the loft and on the couch with cricket legend Omar Henry. Now, let's chat a little bit more about your very short, brief career in the, the South African team. There's a lot of controversy when you were included, of course, in the team, the first non-white player uh, to play a test match. Tell me a little bit more about that experience. 
Well, yeah, you, I mean, like I said, I never thought at the time when I made the decision to play cricket as a career that I would ever play for South Africa. It was just too far-fetched. Mm. Um, but as the years gone by and you're playing and you follow on what's happening politically in the country, um, and I was still in Scotland and I came home every six months to play cricket here and then left to go to Scotland. I incidentally played for Scotland even before I played for South Africa. Wow. So I never, I, I represented Scotland first in international cricket. Uh, before your own country? For, the, for South Africa. So I had a taste of it, um, and, uh, but that was in 50 over cricket, one day cricket. So I knew more or less of what the international scene was like, um, and I had a, that taste. So I looked at when South Africa got into international cricket and the team left for India to go and play, play in that, um, I think they called it the, the Peace um, uh, Series. Uh, I was still in Scotland and I looked at how we played and I said to my wife, no, no, no. Uh, as old as I am, <laughs> I think I could... Still do it. I can still do it. But I had to come back permanently. Um, so it was a big decision. Uh, wife wasn't too happy. <laughs> but, you know, we eventually yeah. agreed and, and, and came back. Um, and fortunately, uh, with my relationship with my wife, we, I made it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, that was, that was it. Um, you don't realize what's actually waiting for you mm. when you get selected. Um, you realize everybody's got their opinions, etc. Absolutely. And you've got to you've got to grow up very quickly. You've got to deal with it, mm. um, and uh, it tests your character. Um, it tests your determination, your self belief. Yeah. And you just got to believe that you can do it and. But, I mean, you made your debut and you were 40 years old. Were you a bit frustrated that it came so late in your life? No, I wasn't. It wasn't in my plans. At all? Um, for me, that was a bonus. Oh. Um, but I saw the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and I had to make a decision. That was possibly the toughest um, because what I bowled up in Scotland, I had to then say thank you very much. Um, and then restart back in South Africa yeah. again, all over, because um, two of my children were born in, in Scotland. Scotland. I, uh, I had property in Scotland. My both girls went to school in Scotland. Mm. Um, they couldn't speak Afrikaans at all, and sure. I, Afrikaans was my first language. So, you know, there was a lot of confusion mm. within my own family as well. Yeah. So all these things you had to deal with, and at the end it was quite good. And you ended up playing three ODIs and three test matches, and that was a very short career, but it left such an impact. Did you know at that time that you'd leave such a legacy? Well, I think once I decided to make that change, yeah. I realised that not only South Africa, but the whole world will be on me. Um, fortunately, I had enough experience um, playing for Scotland in international cricket, playing a lot of first-class cricket in this country. So I knew the players, I knew the standard, I knew the yeah. quality. Um, I re when I stepped over the boundary line that morning, that first morning, um, I realised that the world was watching. watching and. Um, there was a lot of expectation. Um, there was a lot of people who didn't think I should be there. So you sort of deal with it and you say, right, I'm here now. Um, I've had my career in cricket. This is the bonus. This is basically the last hurdle yeah. in terms of my playing. I might as well go out there and enjoy it.
And you didn't disappoint. Not only did you enjoy it, but you left such a, you know, a lasting impact on, you know, so many South African cricket lovers and watchers. But let's talk about Rory uh, Kleinfeld, your son-in-law, who's also a professional cricketer. Do you think your love of cricket rubbed off on your daughter? So much so that <laughs> her husband now plays, or found a man that plays cricket and loves cricket too. Well, my, both my daughters, their first ever sport they played was mini cricket. Um, uh, that was when we were living in, in Bloemfontein um, mm. and they were some of the first girls to play mini cricket. Rihanna was a left-hander, so <laughs> there was some kind of connection between me and her. Um, and they both ended up playing hockey because there was no cricket at school level for them at that time. I knew that two things about my daughters. One, when they've grown up, they will travel because they were brought up on aeroplanes and airports. That's where they spend most of their time when we were traveling. They, think, they thought at the time that the aeroplane was a car. <laughs> um, so I knew they were gonna travel. Yeah. The second one was I knew they were gonna like sport and that they're possibly gonna be attracted by sportsmen but I didn't know which one was going to go <laughs> and marry a cricketer or a sportsman. Yeah. Um, so it ended up Rihanna. That's incredible. And, you know, not only your, your daughters, but are, are there other members of your family who are uh, cricket lovers? You did mention earlier on in our interview that you come from a very sporting, uh, sport-loving family. Anybody else apart from your daughters and yourself? Well, my, my lad lam son, um, who is now 23, so he... He had to make a choice at school between playing hockey and playing cricket. Mm. Um, he could have played under 18 for South Africa, uh, hockey, um, and he had to make a choice between hockey and cricket. Eventually he made um, the choice to cricket. He played for South Africa under 19. Um, but I said to him, look, my parents told me to study first. I'm going to tell you exactly the same. Yeah. Um, but you have to. I didn't. You have to. So he, he's got a year and a half left on his studies. Um, so he's leaving for overseas now. Wow. To see what he can do. Um, so that's him. My wife, um, she loves cycling. Um, she ended up practicing with me, fitness, running and whatever. Yeah. Today she ran, she had about six or seven comrades. Wow. Um, sure. And I'm the spectator. Because <laughs> your work is done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Irma. A little bit later, I want to ask you, you know, what you think the state of uh, cricket in South Africa in terms of the inclusion of uh, people of color, a little bit more, and, uh, you know, development and the youngsters who want to get into and sit where you are and create a legacy like you. But uh, after the break, we move from a legend of cricket to the youth by taking a look at the Cricket School of Excellence and the work they do with the youth of South Africa. Don't move, it's Afternoon Express. Welcome back. We're live on SABC3. This is Afternoon Express. Now, with transformation being one of the most topical subjects in South African sports today, the Cricket School of Excellence, in partnership with Australian Aid, have partnered up to host development clinics for the next year for aspirant cricketers in the township of Kailicha. We're joined by the managing director, Mr. Ryan Moran. Welcome to Afternoon Express. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. What is the School of Excellence all about? Well, the Cricket School of Excellence was launched in 1999. Um, basically running holiday cl clinic programs and private coaching and small group coaching. And over the last 16 years, we just, we've grown to four provinces around South Africa, just offering the, our young cricketers the opportunity to get good coaching and good structures. That's fantastic. Of course, this is a South African initiative, right? How did the Australian aid then decide to, uh, you know, want to be part of this? Well, for the last 10 years, I've been working with kids from the townships and street kids, and I've been struggling to get funding and assistance. Mm. And I did a little bit of research in the direct aid program through the Australian High Commission, um, wow. came on board after a lot of applications and documentation. And with their support, we're able to offer a lot more services to these uh, aspiring young cricketers, from adopter school to elite coaching programs to holiday clinics in the townships, and getting the kids to the local schools to interact with the boys so they can obviously enjoy themselves and get to know each other and 
have a fun time. That's amazing. Now let's talk a little bit about the cricketers and who can be part of this, you know, uh, project. Ages, race, you know, uh, who, who comes to the Cricket School of Excellence? The Cricket School of Excellence, um, we cater for all boys and girls from age 4 to 14. And the older boys or girls come in for more technical training, or a one-on-one -on -one or small group training. Mm. But um, we open it for all ages, from 4 to 14, all races. I mean, we don't, we don't close shop to any boys who aren't good enough. Everybody gets, must get the equal opportunity to come in and get coached. And hopefully we can improve the game from the technical and behavioral side of uh, coaching. Absolutely. I mean, transformation has been a word that we've been hearing in South African sport for the past couple of months and years. How does your school then, you know, um, support transformation? What are some of the uh, projects that you do in, or, in order to make sure that you, you know, fulfill your mandate? Yeah, well, for the last 10 years, we've been busting the kids in from the Kalicha and Samora, yeah. Michelle and Delph to our local clinics so the boys can get an opportunity. But I always feel we've got to get... Um, quantity where to get born boys playing the game of cricket and boys and girls. Yeah. So we now take the cricket school to the township where we host um, small small clinics um, up to 150 to 300 um, wow. kids and then we bring in the nutritional side, the behavioral side, the life skills and we make sure that those kids have a great time and we make sure that they leave there after four days learning the game of cricket because cricket teaches you a lot about life about discipline. Absolutely, that, that is you know, my next question, that what are some of the results, what are some of the benefits for a young uh, a child to be and be playing cricket? Yeah, I mean, these boys aren't only taught about how to hold a bat, a bowl, catch. Mm. I think this goes a lot further than that. Um, so we promote the life skills, um, healthy living. Um, we try to get the right people to come in and support mm. us in that, because we don't know everything. We need Absolutely. to get the right people supporting us. And it's great to see how these kids progress and how they learn and take it back home and take it back onto the fields. Um, doesn't mean it's cricket, they can take it into any sports they play, the discipline. Yeah, and let's talk about their homes and how, and you know, the impact that it has had in the communities, in Kailicha, in their families. Yeah, I mean, we go out there, we meet the parents and they're always very applauding and they're yeah. very positive about the work we're doing. I mean, it's pretty sad, like over the years, a year of horrific stories of what's happened to young students who've been coming to us. Yeah. But you, I mean, these guys have t a tough upbringing, so to see them perform, these guys are so talented, they're raw. I think they just need the right coaching, the right, the right direction, and they can go far, far away. There's a lot of talent out there. You can see nowadays these boys are not playing for South Africa. Um, <sighs> I just think they need to be guided, helped, and put in the right structures. Absolutely. Well, Ryan, you're doing incre incredible work. Uh, Danilo is standing by with young Jack and Tatinda. You look very handsome there. Danilo. What, oh, me or oh, the two yes, gentlemen? Danny. I'm not too sure which uh, one you're talking Jack. about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to about to teach a thing or two because I, I learned about last week, I think, something about holding the ball correctly. If I'm not mistaken, it's got something to do with this tatenda, like something like this, right? Yeah. Is that correct? So I managed to get my grip right on the ball. Now it's time for us to have a look at how to hold the bat correctly. Are you going to show me? Okay, yeah. Okay, um, what does the grip look like? Um, okay, that's fine. So just make sure when you pick up the bat, you pick it up like you're picking up an axe. Uh -huh. So your hand like this on okay, the V. So right hand at the bottom, yes, yeah, right, right hand. And then you, when you pick it up, pick it up on the V, mm -hmm. and you turn your body. Okay. Then you get nice, your arms, so like a circle almost, and then you play straight through okay. the line. So if I pick it up like an axe, pick it up like a V, yeah. right? Hand back there. Yeah. Hold it like this. Yeah, it's like this. Oh my gosh, my yeah. elbow, how do you but do that? You don't Stand up oh, and then oh, lower down. So, oh, yeah, I'm being taller. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're so bossy, then, Tatinda. Then bend, then bend your knees a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what your coach will teach you, to be bossy first and then skills <laughs> later. Okay, so Jack, are you going to try and uh, bowl me at an underarm? I'm just going to do a block. I don't want to break any of our cameras. So just gently. Okay, so. Jack, please. Yeah! Okay. okay, that was pretty useless, but it was okay, right? <laughs> if you just step into it. Okay, so this, I must take a step left. forward into the thing. Okay, yeah, but softly. Okay. Very nice. Hey, thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'm doing a thing or two about cricket. <laughs> Attend, it's good to have you. I hope you've learned so much from this course. What has been your most valuable lesson? Um, that you can strive for anything that you want, like, because he's been such a help to, like, the for the learners that yeah. come. And I uh, just want to say thank you for, for helping me, like, awesome. personally, yeah. Jack, I think you're dying for a high five. Please, can I have a high five? <laughs> Legend, thanks for coming to show me a thing or two, everybody. Now, as you know by now, the brand new season of Winner Home will be hosted on Afternoon Express. From May every day, we will dedicate a portion of the show to the progress of the young designers as they battle it out to design and create dream homes. And you, the viewers, stand a chance to win one of the three luxurious apartments. Remember that applications are still open to young designers, and we have extended the, the, the deadline for those applications to apply. This is honestly a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. 
opportunity that could kickstart a long and successful career. So make sure you apply. Take a look. Welcome back to the show. Today is all about the gentleman's game of cricket. We're back on the couch with our cricket experts, Ryan Morano and Omar Henry, who's currently the convener of selectors at the Cape Cobras. We're chatting all about cricket, and if you're a young person interested in the game or you're a parent watching and you're not sure if your child has what it takes to make it professionally, then you've tuned in just at the right time. Now, gentlemen, my first question to you, and I'm going to throw it to you, Ryan. If I notice that my baby boy or baby girl has a skill as very good at cricket, what are the first steps I should take? Well, it's quite important not to start too early. Um, I think it's important not to push your child from a too young age. You've got to make sure that they're enjoying the game, go ahead and hit the ball mm -hmm. from the age of four, five, six. Allow them just to hit the ball through the line. doesn't matter where the ball goes. And then once you see them improve and you can see there's potential, I think they need to get the right guidance. Um, okay. I think too many parents nowadays try to teach the kids from a young age and expect them to um, become the next superstar. So just you've got to make sure that they get the right coaching so the correct techniques are implemented. All right. Now, Omar, where are some of the, you know, the places I can take my child? Are there clinics? Are there you know, special coaches or special places, for instance? Well, yeah, I think um, there's what we call cricketing schools, um, whether it's a primary school or a high school that focus on cricket. Then obviously there's private coaches nowadays where you can take your kid and, mm. and pay for coaching. Um, and then, like Ryan says, it, 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 for me, it's about the passion and the love, the enjoyment of the game. Um, and then somebody in the coaching fraternity mm. will inform the parents or even the kid yeah. that, hold on, you've got potential, you've got talent. Do you want to pursue this? Um, you know, but first and foremost is the enjoyment of it. Fantastic. The passion and the love. Absolutely. And Ryan, earlier on you mentioned how some of your boys are now playing for South Africa. Uh, let, me, let us take it back a little bit. How do provincial trials work, for instance? Um, the boys are selected from their schools or clubs and they go to regional nets mm. and they have trials on the weekends and the boys are given opportunities to perform. And I, I mean, I hope nowadays the guys, the selectors are looking at results over a period of time because some cricketers and sportsmen do go through a bad patch. Mm. So it's important that the selectors do watch over a period of time. So their trials and they go to regional in, um, trials of the boys are selected to represent their provinces at the national weeks. Fantastic. And let's say, you know, uh, my child can't necessarily play cricket professionally. What other careers are there within, uh, the, you know, the cricket sport? Well, if you look nowadays, you get international umpires. It's a full-time job. Um, professional umpires in terms of uh, standing at franchise level. Um, that's oh. also a full-time job. Um, then there's obviously coaching. Um, then there's to be, you can become a groundsman. Uh, you can become an administrator uh, in terms of cricket. Um, so there's, there's various options within. Mm. Um, and I think the game need those people um, that comes in, that loves the game, um, that cares for the game, um, and it's long hours. Um, mm -hmm. It's not. It's not easy. It's not like soccer or rugby where it's over within mm. hour and a half, whatever. It's four days, five days that you're dealing with cricket. Um, so it, it can become very challenging. And it's also quite a, an expensive sport. You know, Ryan, in terms of equipment, is it worth the investment as a parent to get that really good cricket bat for your little one? You know, the, the gear and uh, the coaching, the time, all of that. Um, I think when the boys or girls are at a young age and they're starting up with soft balls or slaz balls, I think they mustn't look at the top range equipment. They must okay. just go for the, the entry level bat. Um, and then when they start getting older, obviously they start playing with a hard ball from the age of eight or nine. And then they can move towards, obviously, the protective gear is very important. Um, so I think they've got to just take it easy. They don't jump into too, yeah. too deep, otherwise it's, right. the pockets get burnt. So <laughs> cricket equipment nowadays, you can buy a top-of-the-range bat for anywhere between six to 9,000 Rand. Sure. And sometimes those bats, they don't last very long if yeah. you're playing a lot of cricket. So I think the parents should okay. just entry level. And as, a, as you see your son progressing through the age groups and the levels, 
then start picking up the level with regards to the equipment. Fantastic. That's some great advice. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I've learned so much today. Well, uh, along with all of that cricket knowledge we've gained on the show today, we're also giving away a very exciting prize. Ryan has been kind enough to offer cricket clinics to lucky young viewers in five different cities, namely Cape Town, Durban, Johannesburg, Rustenburg, and Peter Maritzburg. This is the perfect opportunity for anyone looking to improve their game. All you need to do is SMS the keyword express your name and city to double three seventy eight and standard charts and don't forget to add your city all right sms's will cost you one rand fifty t's and c's apply and can be found on our website afternoonexpress.co.za a big thank you to ryan and of course to our cricket legend omar hendry back to the kitchen with you danilo Indeed. So we're making something so delicious in the kitchen today. I'm really loving on the Facebook page at the moment, Afternoon Express's account. I was going through them. You guys are hating all the puns that we posted over there, and you're posting some of your own ones, and they are hilarious. So if you have any more cricket puns, you can tweet us at Afternoon Chat using that hashtag, Afternoon Express, or go into the Facebook page, Afternoon Express, and go and comment on the poster with Clem and myself and tell us which of the puns that you have available. So in the recipe that we're making today, we, all we've got to do is make the actual uh, waffle bread that we've, that we've got to make. We've done the, the sweet and sticky short rib already. It mm -hmm. looks so amazing. It's looking a lot oh. less. Yeah. I wonder why. I was not nibbling while Bonang was chatting. I swear I was not nibbling. <laughs> What's this on the side of your... Okay. Thought so. <laughs> we're clear, we're clear. What's next? <laughs> so under waffle bread. Yeah. So this is a prepared dough that we've made. And the recipe is on our website along okay. with all of our other dishes oh, that we've made. Oh, you make the dough too? Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's yeah. so amazing. Well done. What do you think we did? Like, we think we bought it. Well, I don't know. I'm just wondering whether we got our old recipes that are on the website or people can make their own dough the way <laughs> yeah. they like to. You're okay. a pro. You know, you know. Okay, cool. so I'm going to teach you about, you've learned about blocking with the bat today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you about the sacred method of tiger claw. Ah. <gasps> Not be dead serious. Oh, really? Yes. Show me. So we've got to get the buns looking like these guys, you see? Mm -hmm. Pretty nice and smooth. And for yes. that, okay, I've got dough in my hands now. But for that, you need tiger claw. Okay, okay I, cool. I, I have tiger claw. There we go. So show me your tiger claw. Ha. Ah. Okay, and now okay. the trick is get your ball. You don't mm -hmm. make the sound when you do it. Okay, sorry. So okay, tiger get... claw. Keep it like that. Was you take the, you're making it worse. Okay, okay, and then you got it. Cage your, your ball. Oh, oh, whoops. You see? And just move your hand with your claw, right? And bring your claw in together a little more. A little more. Uh -huh, uh, you more, see, you have more, many more. years of practice. I've got many years until I master tiger claw balls. Tiger claw. Are you a black apron at this? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is, after you've done that, by doing that, you kind of bring the ball into itself. Mine. You see, a little practice, a little practice, and it becomes seamless like that guy. Ah. And you see, let me just do it to you quickly. You see, I could have done like two at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get them like nice and smooth oh, like I that. I see, brilliant. Okay. And that's and what point? happens when you use the, the claw. What's the point of doing that? Why can't you just leave it like this? You don't want to have a knobbly bread. You want it to be like a nice smooth ah. bun. So as it rises in a waffle iron, it rises evenly. Okay, cool. A lot of practice. We'll practice uh, tomorrow. We will, okay. we will, Grandmaster. So we've got our waffle iron. Super hot, you can see the steam. Yes, yeah. And it's just been... Greased with a little bit of spray and cook on there. Okay. Pop. And, and I'm guessing, obviously, if you don't have a, a waffle maker at home, is there something else like a snack which maker or something we can use? Absolutely. You could use a griddle pan as well. What you're going to do then is you'll cook the one side first, uh -huh. flip it over, and cook the other side. If okay. you don't have a griddle pan, I, I think you were about to say that, Nick. I was about to say, what if you don't have one of those? Yes. <laughs> Frying pan. A little bit of oil in your pan. Just pop them in there, put the lid on. That way they steam as the they fry. Okay, I see. So it's any, any way you can do it at home. It's so whatever you've got at home, try it. Exactly. Least. We cater to everyone. Awesome. There we go. So we've got our buns done. Let me just put this over here. I've got your buns done. Oh, wait, wait, like, right. You know, done, like me, I'm done. I've got your buns done. No. <laughs> I didn't even show what happens after Mickey, they're Mickey. done. I'm, I'm going to ignore. Just ignore me. Just carry on cooking because I think people at home are like, <laughs> gonna go, oh, okay. So you get the buns. After about five minutes in the waffle iron, they come mm -hmm. out looking like this. Yummy. Super crispy on the outside, super fluffy on the Ooh, inside. Yum. So let's get started. So oh, everybody's so gonna pull their own, right? So you wanna grab one? I will grab my own, yes. And take a nice big one. Okay. So you can start off with maybe. So I'm gonna go, okay, you take this. I'll take these ones. Okay, cool. A little bit of curry, curry. Okay, you know any order. I'm gonna go with meat first. And you see, I'm putting coriander in mine. I'm very, very proud of you because I know you're not a big fan. Mm -hmm. Some basil. This is basil. 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 Yes. Yeah. Basil. I've awesome. been told once before that I'm gonna say almond, almond, almond. Oh, it is the correct pronunciation. Yes, it is. Almond, it is. But... And then some carrot. I just pass through a mandolin slicer. Very careful when you do that. Cool. Try to get your fingers caught in there. To and get those the thin, let me grab it over here. Thin slices of carrot. You could also just grate it if you want. We're just being fancy in the last today. Okay. How do you make them thin like that? Is it just with the... With a mandolin slicer. A what? Or mandolin slicer. But once again, we can do to everybody a vegetable peeler as well. Will work. Will work. Thin slices and then some spring onion in there. Mm. So what you're going to end up with is something that looks like this. 
Let me see yours. I didn't break my carrot, so mine kind of just looks like it's just been shoved together because I don't know what I was doing. But you know, it looks amazing. So because oh, no, no. That, that meat is quite fiery, it's got all those strong flavors in there. A little bit, a little bit stretching over you. A little bit of sour cream, just oh, a little bit. yummy. Touch. She was making like a little kind of tortilla wrappy side of sort of thing, but just Steam with a complete ish. Toe We're just twist. crossing cultures today. Oh, yummy. This and that's what you end up with. And it looks so amazing. I can't wait to give this one a big taste. I'm definitely thinking Bonang and the rest of our cricketers are so excited to taste this one. If you guys want to make this at home for your family or your friends, find the recipe on our website, afternoonexpress.co.za. You can also find the shopping list available for you right over there. It's so simple. All the ingredients, everything you need to know, afternoonexpress.co.za. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. We're live on SABC3, but it's time for us to just round up uh, the show. We've had a really inspiring, motivating Monday today, mm. and unfortunately, we have to say goodbye. I know, but before we go, I have to ask you guys a quick question, because, I mean, I've been following a lot of the cricket of late, because when I'm on my radio show on the weekends, it's always on the TVs, and I'm seeing so many new dynamics coming into the cricket world at the moment. T20s, your opinion? on the sort of way that our attention spans are so short so they've made cricket also <laughs> short too. What is your opinion? I think it's great for the game. Um, Do you think so? Yeah. Attracting a lot of attention, a lot of spectators. Um, and also, a lot of the players are getting opportunities yeah. to take it further. More games, more players, I suppose. Fantastic. Well, if you look at the modern generation, um, you know, everything is quick, it's instinct. It's, yeah. Uh, mm. So, they're going to love this. Um, and like Ryan says, there's more money. Uh, mm. They can go all over the world, work for a month in Australia, work yeah. for a month in Scotland. India, <laughs> and wherever, <laughs> and uh, great life, you Absolutely. know, uh, fantastic sure. experience, yeah. um, and everybody loves it. Yeah, it's a, definitely a family sport. Now, let me go to uh, the social media. We've got a tweet here from Stephen at night zero one rider says hashtag afternoon express. Oh my Henry, can you please play for the T twenty team? Speaking of which, yeah, <laughs> you know, winky smiley face. <laughs> what do you say about that, Miss Henry? Uh, he's got a good memory, possibly. He's going back very long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I possibly um, would have favoured T twenty as well. Uh, knowing my own ability and yeah. what I can do uh, in cricket. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, at my age now, maybe at 40, I possibly would have given it a go, but <laughs> not, now. T40, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not now. Not now. I right. must ask you, now that you obviously are not as involved in the actual activities of the game itself, what are you up to at the moment? Look, I am uh, I'm the convener still, um, possibly until the end of this year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm involved in the academy. Um, Ryan spoke, spoke about the development and about the game. Uh, it's very close to my heart. Um, right. It's one of the reasons why I came back um, to plough back and, and, and see what talent there, are, there is at the moment. Mm. It's raw, um, but there's a lot of challenges. Absolutely. And I think I can assist how to deal with those challenges mm. um, because it is no different when I grew up um, to the kids today. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but it is possible and it can oh, be achieved. Absolutely. Well, people like so you, inspiring. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Omar, for coming. Ryan, for all the incredible work that you do. For the food, we oh, thank yummy. you. We're ready to <laughs> dig in. That looks incredible. If you want all the information about the uh, Cricket School of Excellence, of course, you can find all of that on our incredible website, Afternoon Express. And Danilo, thank you very much for the food. It's all a the pleasure, ingredients guys. It and looks the recipe amazing. Yeah. is also on the website. AfternoonExpress.ca.za. Good night. Happy yeah. meeting, everybody. Cheers. See you tomorrow at <laughs> 4. Coming up tomorrow on Afternoon Express, we take a look at the I Was Shot in Joburg campaign, which gives a platform for street kids to learn a skill and generate an income. We also chat to South African first black female winemaker, Carmen Stevens, and we're joined by author Jean Archery to chat about financial education for kids. Another Feel Good Production. Hi, YouTubers. Thank you so much for watching. Your support means the world to us. Join the Afternoon Express family by subscribing to our channel right here. And we'll keep you up to date with all our recipes and, of course, our fabulous episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment and share this video. We do love it when you express yourself. <laughs>